Hi, welcome to Kagalex Workshop. Today's session is going to be on introduction to quantum data science. Our speaker today is Amar. Amar is going uh, to provide us a wealth of knowledge around this topic. A little bit about Amar Jashem. Uh, he's a curious soul with many paradigms of intellect and many dimensions of weakness as well. His journey with data science started in his early years of undergrad, where he taught himself coding strictly through online courses. However, it was too tedious for him without having a philosophy attached to it. And that's when he randomly came across data science on a Google search where we have to evaluate a business case study in data terms using an advanced tools like coding to build a solution for a business. He continued to study online science. I'm sorry. He continued to study online since then and successfully completed two years of the university. In addition, Amar is, is, is almost finished completing his online studies and achieving his master's in data science. LinkedIn and Kaggle helped develop his career and learning journey. He would like to give a special thank you to his LinkedIn and Kaggle peers that assisted him along the way. Most importantly, he would like to thank his parents who supported his decisions in every step of the way. So I'm now going to turn it over to Amar, and he is going to lead our workshop today. Thank you so much, Rainy, for that impressive introduction. And... Uh, Thank you so much to the entire Kaggle team for making this webinar come true. And I would like to uh, welcome everyone who's joined and everyone who has actually wanted to have taken out the time to want to learn my topic. So now Rainy gave you a very uh, like, uh, like a descriptive like introduction about me. So let me now give you an introduction from the data science mindset. Okay. So this is me. I'm a data science consultant with a passion for using data. So I train professionals in business intelligence and data science. My specializations of research and even work are mainly educational technologies. And I apply data and analytics within it during my research. And I've published 18 plus articles on global international platforms. And I have won a data science article competition as well. That was once in India, though I'm a Pakistani. Yes. And I have been ranked on the top 1% contributors in a Kaggle and GitHub. And I've published up till now around six research papers and that without any uh, university or any professor uh, allied to me. And I've published multiple courses on multiple platforms. Even this uh, workshop I'm giving you today, it's actually some content from an upcoming course of mine that will be on quantum computing using data science. Okay, so this is my introduction in my terms. So now let's start with the workshop. So let's start with what is quantum computing? I'm sure it's a term, you know, every one of you has heard at least once. So, sorry about that. So quantum computing, it's a cutting edge field that utilizes the principles of quantum mechanics, okay, to perform complex communications. Unlike classical computers that use bits, quantum computers use quantum bits, okay, like, or we call them qubits, which allow it to, which allow, you know, events or even outcomes to exist in multiple states simultaneously. So like, you know, in this real world, I am alive and talking. But if we look at the quantum realm, right, then I can be alive, I can be dead, I can also be reborn, and I can also be just being born at the same time. Because in the quantum uh, universe, there are infinite number of possibilities at one point in time. And same goes with these fundamentals within computers. We could predict multiple events at once. Okay. And we can solve, you know, so many complex tasks that we cannot solve with classical computers. Like, you know, NASA uses quantum computers to measure the friction of black holes, which is basically trillions of bytes of data at once. So you can tell how powerful quantum computers are if they can do all of that. So how is quantum computing done? Like, you know, computers use binary, right? So they always store events or even any sort of, you know, variable in either zero or one. Like whatever, whatever we feed it, it will either understand it as zero or one, whether it's yes or no. But in quantum computing, right, with quantum mechanics, zero and one can exist at the same time in even the same event. That example, a prediction of a future event can happen today. It can also happen today later. It can also happen, you know, today or tomorrow. So, yeah. So quantum computers, you know, allow us to measure those multiple infinite states of one event happening, right? 
and the quantum mechanics ka property of quantum mechanics we call it superposition which allows us to understand how different these events can happen in one particular point in time okay which classical computers if you try doing it with them they'll explode okay so now applications of quantum computing in data science so yes quantum computers can revolutionize data science and solve complex problems in it agriculture and even supply chain especially manufacturing because it can crunch data like nobody's business so yeah and powerful machine learning models with quantum based processing you know it can predict volatile events that otherwise can't be computed with no accuracy which you all know, which everyone who's done machine learning would actually be able to understand here you always get 0.20 as an accuracy like 20 percent sometimes 30 percent for these you know for what classical computers are doing at these rates right for accuracy quantum computers can do it at 80 to 100 percent because they can crunch data at a much efficient pace than classical computers can so yeah so uh, basically now simulation of experiments and events using raw ideas and variables to estimate risks right because you've seen in sci-fi movies right that they show you you know even in star trek or even in star wars they show you holograms of events or scenarios that are happening right so we can actually make that a reality with quantum computers and it's already used in defense and even in organizations like ibm and other places like even google who have the uh, funds to support a quantum computing server right and building powerful cybersecurity applications with minimized hacking because you know like just to hack into a classical computer you can use multiple tactics and one person alone can hack into it but to hack into something as powerful as a quantum computer you will need an army of hackers so for that you would have to also pay a lot of people too and with that amount of money you know being traced can be traced anywhere in the world so yeah so they can't hack into quantum computers anytime soon until technology becomes extremely cheap and now quantum machine learning now, this is the interesting part for even data scientists here so quantum machine learning combines the power of quantum computing with traditional machine learning techniques right because you can use quantum power for the normal machine learning techniques we're already using with python code or r code right we all know regression classification clustering and all of that and it explores the use of quantum algorithms and quantum data structures to enhance performance of machine learning tasks right such as classification clustering and regression like we discussed right and quantum computers they can analyze extremely large amounts of data like i quoted it can measure the rate of a black hole right so yeah so you can you know store an entire global com like multinational company's data in one server and analyze it in seconds with a quantum computer and it holds great promise in tackling data science problems which right now we cannot analyze because of the complexity of data behind them example we can't analyze when human personalities will change right because that's like trillions of data to decode but quantum computers can do that classical computers can't and simulations right you can study behavior of complex systems that are impossible to simulate on classical computers so like you know university of chicago and uh, similar ivy league universities and some other universities like carnegie mellon they have things called policy labs where you know you can even make simulations on actual scenarios happening in society or how society will change so quantum computers allow that or make it possible because otherwise the data is so complex to figure out or to even standardize and they can be used already a lot of some pharmaceutical companies are experimenting on trying to create new drugs with quantum machines which you can't normally do with classical machines right and they can be used to test new theories and hypotheses which otherwise we would never be able to test for example if i want to test that hey can uh, how many dimensions is amar alive versus how many how many dimensions is amar not alive right now in that would be like for some classical computer legit to impossible to figure out but a quantum computer can do that because it can crunch data right so in the same storage space which a classical computer would need right example you all use google like uh, you use google you use onedrive and you even use all these cloud storages right online even icloud to store your data so whenever your data gets full 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 right so you have to buy extra space in order to use extra data but it that's only for classical computers for quantum computers that's never an issue because what happens is in that same storage space what quantum computers do they break down that data into smaller chunks of data that way you can the data stays the same but in smaller unit sizes so you can continue to keep filling data within the same unit sizes 
basically making data storage infinite. Yeah. Although that's not a reality anytime soon for the real potential of quantum computers, but humans are slowly getting there as well. And cybersecurity applications. Quantum resistant cryptography. So quantum computers can be used to break current encryption standards, right? So, you know, a lot of hacking, which we can't do right now with normal computers, we can do that with quantum computers because hackers, you know, what they do when they try to hack into a website, they test a multiple amount of combinations of your passwords using programs, which automatically do it for them. Yeah. So, but those programs have limitations too. It can probably, let's say a billion or a million programs. One program can, can make a combination of codes for, but quantum computers can do that for trillions at one point. So yeah. You can hack into places that you can never hack, could never have hacked before into. And quantum power network security with network security backed by quantum computing, as I said before, you need an army of hackers to be able to like, you know, penetrate through the firewall skins or security layers because it's too much computing power to like, you know, try to burst through at once. And quantum powered blockchain. So we already know what blockchain is, right? Like proof of concept, smart contracts, and you know, people completely, you know, decentralized a decentralized money value chain where people are basically verifying one another's activities with quantum computing we could be, it could become you know much cheaper to use and we could use it you know in even the most smallest of devices which otherwise we don't consider possible right now to use because it makes storage infinite now this is a good question everyone asks is quantum computing only for big companies or small companies right so small companies can also implement quantum computing. It's not like they can't. They use quantum simulators, like, you know, program softwares that can simulate the behavior of quantum computers. And, you know, like now some cloud services are also giving, you know, the quantum services within their cloud. Obviously, it's not perfect yet, but it's slowly also trying to becoming better. And they uh, partner with a quantum computing provider, like, you know, IBM, Amazon, Google, so yeah, several companies offer those quantum computing services and some companies can, you know, rent softwares or server farms from them to use their quantum computing services on their businesses, right? So first of all, this is, I kept this slide very short because I wanted to answer more questions because people have more questions in this field. Okay. But before I start taking questions over here, I would want to like, you know, thank the entire team of Kaggle again for making this possible. And also for all of you who took out their time personally to come over here, I really give you a lot of thanks. But before I get to questions, I want to show you a notebook, right? So yeah, let me just share my uh, Jupyter notebook on how we can use quantum computing in Python. So you can play with it tonight as well. So yeah, let me just open it. Rainy, can, can you see my screen? Rainy? Not yet. Oh, there it goes. Okay. okay. So all of you who are already using Python, right? There's this particular quantum computing library called Kiskit. You know sklearn, right? So Kiskit is the quantum version of sklearn. So yeah, after that, you have to pipe install Kiskit machine learning. It allows you to download all the machine learning dependencies. Okay. You import your data, generate or load a data set, define your quantum instance, and also prepare a quantum feature map. Basically, what kind of features you want to process with quantum computing. And you have to define how much computing power you should allocate towards using quantums. Okay. And you build and train. And over here, I'm building a quantum support vector regression. Okay. It's one of the algorithms I'm using. So yeah. Mark, excuse me, Mark. Do you mind uh, making the screen a little larger for everyone to see? Okay, sorry. Is it a, does it allow you to zoom in or change the size? Okay. Let me check if it's... It should be coming at full screen. I don't know why is that the case. At the very top, I think it, it might allow you to do a zoom in. There might be a plus feature there. Them. 
for now. Oh, there's no plus feature over here, unfortunately. What about file? Is it under file? Yep. Getting back. Or view so, menu. Uh, sorry, what are you saying? Under view at the very top. View under very top. At, uh, at the banner. Mm -hmm. So if you exit, I'm sorry, if you exit okay. full screen, okay. you should be able to see. Yeah, there you go. Is there yeah. a zoom? Okay. Now, now do you see it? It's still small. Does it let you go a little larger? Let me try again. Let's see. Zoom, okay. Let me check. Okay, now. That's better. Yeah. Yes, I will be sharing the notebook to those who ask the question. So yeah. So first you import matplotpy plot plot as plot, and then import numpy as np. After that, i python dot display you import clear output, and then from the y skit library you import quantum circuit, then. Uh, Cobla and L, these are basically the algorithms, okay? And then you import parameter, okay? It's how to set your features in place. And then these are other feature map and then real amplitudes. It's to give you the right quantum computing processing power. And then algorithm global, it's to test the uh, accuracies and metrics. And then you can upload the classifier models, neural network classifier like I imported here in BQC, vector, and then vector regression and then neural network regression from quantum computing. And then from neural networks, you can import sample QNN and estimated QNN. So basic regression. I created a number of sample size and epochs 0 0.2. And okay, I set the slope from negative pi to positive pi, you know, minus 3.142 to plus 3.142. And then I create a target feature X as one column and 50 rows. So, okay, here I've reshaped it. And I've put in minus 3.142 to plus 3.142. And then created a function to further lodge log, that. And I added further extra data as well. Like you can see number of samples plus LB into algorithms. You go global random data, right? This is basically the algorithm. And here's number of samples and one X and Y, right? One column, extra rows of the identified as number of samples plus LB, right? So now I've added extra data over here. So, and I further, you know, create a sub functionality of the ki library with this, just to make, you know, the features more eligible. And now I'm plotting it. So you see, it's as I showed, it's going from minus 3.142 to plus 3.142 to the slope. And these are the data points, which I randomly added over here and here. Okay, for, so for Y and X, this was for X, this was for Y. And the slope matches our calculation of quadratic slope. See? And this is estimator quantum neural networks. So you have to set the feature map for this one. One, name FM. These are inbuilt, okay? These are inbuilt parameters. And yeah, feature map for parameter X first, and then you have to set it for parameter Y. And WF is basically the quantum circuit for Y, and FM is for X. Okay? And then you actualize it. And now you construct a proper quantum circuits combining both of these, right? You compose a feature map and then you compose the add sets over here. And now you construct the QNN. See, estimated QNN first circuit, input params and weight. See, parameters, you look at X and then weight becomes Y. And now you create a callback graph just to visualize it. And then you can you can construct a you construct the regressor after all of that. It's similar to how we already create neural networks in deep learning. And now take a look. With this entire QNN model, we have a 95% accuracy. This is on sample data. And you know, if I was doing classical machine learning models over here, it would have given me a straight hundred percent. But quantum computing takes into account the data points which are otherwise non-usable too. So that's why it excludes them automatically. So yeah, this is what quantum computing is capable of at a minuscule level. Yeah. With that though, I'm. Uh, this would be my, uh, let's say, this would be basically the end of my slides. Now I'm willing to take questions. So let's see. Okay, a few questions are coming. Uh, I've got a question. 
please. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. I want to first ask, um, how did you manage to um, have a lot of data science publications without being affiliated to a university? And uh, well, second, uh, sorry, secondly, I also want to find out uh, how much of CPU and memory usage um, that's you're running this uh, quantum um, simulations you know, impact, does it have uh, quite a lot of CPU and memory usage uh, for your local machine? Okay. Okay. Uh, your name is Nana Kwame? Yes, Excuse please. Me, That's right. Yeah. Okay. okay. So thank you for the good question. And yes. So basically, uh, I'm studying my master's in data science as a virtual student from University of London. And I just did it because, look, uh, I knew university people weren't being supportive. So I just Googled and figured out how to do it. So yeah. Nowadays, the only solution is if you can't, no one's helping you, just Google it and figure out. That's how what, how I did it. I found All publications right. that were willing to accept my paper being a student without sponsorship. And yeah, mm. each of them charged their processing fees. Otherwise, if you're affiliated with a university, the universities take care of the publication charges. But right. yeah, there are some publications who don't take money and some that take very minor amounts. So you can mm. always look into them. And regarding your CPU limitation question, so look, Quantum computing, as I even said, now it's not in its full throttle mode yet. It's still right. in its very baby phases. So right now, I'm using quantum computing using my University of London server. So it's mm. easily running on it without any problems or halts. But if okay. I were to run it on a local machine, even if it's like one terabytes and 16 GB RAM, it would yeah. still pause a bit while okay. I'm trying to run it. So yeah. Right. I'll give it a try oh. and see. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, can I ask a question? Please go ahead, Isigo. Okay, yeah. So uh, I'll just give a little bit of background about myself so it'll be easier to communicate. So I'm currently a master's student at North Carolina State University. Uh, I've taken a course in quantum computing. So, uh, but uh, it was an undergrad level course uh, because it's not my uh, like uh, focus area. So I had a few doubts uh, during that course. I was uh, I was hoping to discuss this with you uh, and uh, get to know uh, about your opinion. So. <clears throat> Yeah. So during uh, my coursework, I did a project on uh, uh, like singular value decomposition using uh, quantum machine learning. So it's basically a variational kind of uh, neural network that basically learns the co uh, coefficients for quantum decomposition. Uh, quantum decomposition. So uh, basically, uh, what I understood throughout the course was that quantum computing, like the using of the superposition principle, it basically parallelizes the data processing. So basically any algorithm that would have, uh, let's say a runtime, uh, uh, an exponential runtime could be reduced to a linear time, right? Yeah, so uh, during the experiment, actually, uh, I found that this was very fascinating and would like speed up uh, like, uh, number crunching algorithms such as neural networks or blockchain something that takes lo like lots like goes through a lot of data it would parallelize them and uh, like reduce the time complexity of those algorithms right but the problem that i faced was that uh, just converting uh, the classical data because quantum data makes no sense to us because it's in a superposed state so unless we go through an observation module uh, the data wouldn't make any sense uh, what i found out was that uh, converting the data from uh, classical uh from its classical counterpart which quantum counterpart basically ansatzing the data uh that itself takes a lot a long period of time and also has uh, a lot of error and uh due to the i guess uh, the hardware level noise so i was wondering uh like was there some method for this error correction and was and have there been any methods researching how to decrease this time because uh without uh, like when we are actually if we think about it as an end-to-end -end task uh, what happens is that maybe the processing part the main machine learning part is it's very fast so it's taking a lot less time compared to their classical counterpart but just converting the data from the classical part to its quantum part like its quantum counterpart that process takes a long period of time so ultimately like we don't get any uh, plausible benefits out of quantum computing at the moment that might be because of the limitations of the current quantum hardware because uh, quantum like all the quantum algorithms are basically running on uh, cloud computers like cloud quantum servers so they can't run on like classical computers right so uh, this is something i was uh, thinking about like how do we uh, cut the time 
so that we can have plausible benefits of using quantum algorithms and also uh, how do we uh, go about the error correction part uh, caused by the noise of the machine okay so that's a good question a very good question as ago so basically look like you i even noted in my presentation and even you also further elaborated on quantum computing has a lot of hardware limitations right now so if you're using quantum computing on cloud services it's supposed to be for a data set which you cannot use on classical computers like you know but if you, if your entire business case can easily be resolved using you know machine learning or any other you know non quantum computing algorithm then go with it but if you really want to apply quantum computing to the same data set then you'd have to not change the cross validation or the metrics you have to change the data processing batch level right example if you're processing 100 terabytes at once divide them into files of 10 10 terabytes each and process it on the algorithm one at a time and then take an average like a bagging approach to see what the accuracy is so you have to change your strategy and tactics on how to use quantum computing due to its current limitations until technology can come to a point where we don't have to look at look into these problems does uh, that answer your question yeah uh, actually i was also researching about uh, the applications of quantum algorithms on classical computers so uh, uh, basically uh, recently i believe uh, a student in the university in a french university has come up with a way to implement uh, quantum algorithms for classical data in a way that basically reduces the time complexity for example uh, let's say uh, like let's go with the discrete time fourier transform right so uh, when you do a quantum time fourier transform it's basically like a divide uh, the best uh, use case scenario for discrete time uh, fourier transform would be a divide and conquer approach right that would reduce the uh, that has like the least amount of time complexity but quantum uh, like uh, the algorithm for quantum fourier transform again like exponentially reduces that time so that is what i was wondering just preparing uh, the uh, classical data like instead of preparing the classical data into its qubit form uh what uh, what if we just use the uh, things that we have learned from uh, algorithms of like from quantum algorithms and then use uh, that for like classical data is that something that's possible it is inherently very possible but at the same time the computing costs of going to quantum computers as you know are still very high right so yeah. if you don't need quantum computers for the problem it is not advisable to go and use them because they take a strain on your machine capability In performing okay. parallel computing tasks, and yes, um, uh, before anyone else asks any question, let me just take the chat questions first. Okay, Ritu Raj asked, "Why should we? Uh, when should we use quantum neural uh, network instead of classical neural network?" So, like I also explained, Ritu, if your data is very complex for a classical neural network to decode and understand, and gives a very low accuracy, then you go for quantum computers as a secondary approach. And okay, uh, Nitin. Tan Jayan, sorry, forgive me. I'm very really bad with name pronunciations. Forgive me for that. If I'm if I'm saying anything wrong, does QSkit and QSkit machine learning only simulate quantum computers, or does it use an API to talk to a real quantum computer? So basically, uh, they are algorithms stored with Anaconda servers, right? So yes, they are APIs in a way as well that they communicate through Anaconda servers on their computing algorithms stored within them, right? But at the same time. <clears throat> they do simulate a quantum computer as well because you're calling that api onto your computer on your machine and running it okay and kushank bansal is there any benefit of quantum computing other than degrees in computation time it's not just computation time you're improving computational accuracy you're building more powerful applications and powerful models which otherwise could not have been constructed without them and also as okay and uh, shristi as a beginner what are the some project ideas to start with quantum computing uh right now so uh, you can look into supply chain or manufacturing because these are the industrial like you know industrial examples that right now are looking into trying to use quantum computers okay there are a lot of data sets available on kaggle to use for them okay anand prakash when you say data is too complex and traditional model accuracy is very low how do we know if the data is insufficient or complex so through our cross validation and accuracy metrics we normally can tell that the data is either uh, too insufficient or the model may not be performing as per its parameters but generally it's also in terms of business understanding like you know if i am evaluating the accuracy of a social network right and it comes out to be 99% that is also wrong correct because it is not possible that a human is going to communicate with a 99% accuracy with another human on this day at this time right 
it's a business case, business logic. It's just not possible. That's how we can also tell that maybe the data is too complex. Any difference in deployment of quantum uh, ML models to production? There is no, okay, Adnan, there is no inherent difference, but uh, generally uh, these quantum models take a much bigger load on the servers. Okay. Can we use it in inference and deployment of large LLMs? What about power consumption and cost? Uh, Riyaj, like I explained, uh, power consumption costs are the main problems right now associated with quantum computing. They can be applied to LLM for better processing and better time response as well. But yeah, and there are experimentations working in that account right now. Okay. And okay, let's see now other questions here. Okay, Kushank uh, Bansal. Can the quantum computing uh, can the quantum computing used with TensorFlow for working with a lot of image size decreases, classification excises would be better in quantum computing? Yeah, it would be better, but again, it depends on the kind of data. For convolutional neural network data, like you know, images and all, quantum computing might provide better accuracy. But if the images are already structured well and they're set in the data set size, then I don't see the need for using quantum machine algorithms there. Okay. Uh, Pranjali, Purane, what differences between quantum neural network and classical neural network? I already explained that part. Okay, and Oryx or Young. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot to me. There are projects right now that are employed with quantum computing. You can even check in IBM and Google's web pages as well. They've actually worked on a few projects here. But if you're asking for sample projects on Kaggle, there are there may be some doing it. I don't know about that part. But there are people who are working on them. But at because of limitations in hardware, like even the previous person pointed out, not everyone can go into this point point right now. Okay, next one, Tulani Adakoka. How can you compare time spent cleaning data to be passed to normal ML algorithms and quantum ML algorithms? Well, uh, data cleaning in quantum uh, in uh, ML algorithms legit happens on its own because quantum computing has superposition. Data can exist in multiple states simultaneously. So cleaning data is not necessarily in that, but in classical it is. So yeah. Okay. I was wondering how do we deal with potential errors of quantum methods to reduce error correction? Yeah. Yeah, Shagayat, uh, Mora, Dirat, forgive me pronunciation problems, but uh, you can uh, do error correction with quantum computing techniques as well. They're available in QSKIT's uh, website as well. You can go there as well. Yeah. But uh, the prerequisites for trying to do quantum computing with machine learning is if you've already done machine learning models and if you want to avoid biases, biases don't exist in the code, they exist in the data. So the data collection part is where you have to look into the biases part more than the ML models. Okay. And uh, if you want, you can all uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn for more uh, detailed advice on this as well. Uh, QC, a best solution for bioinformatics data, Kibala, Francis. Yes. It is a good solution for that because bioinformatic data is very complex and Q and already they're using quantum computing for human genomes and genetics as well in trying to make proper classification of genes. So it's a good idea. What is Ankit Srivasta? What is the scope of quantum computing in space technology? All of space technology is quantum computing. NASA already uses it and Inter International Space Station has been relying on it for all of our satellite communications and space communications with different planets, including the Mars rover. So yeah, without quantum computing, space technology would never be possible. So yeah, Anand Prakash, why quantum models perform well with complex data? How do they differ from traditional modeling methods? Okay, this is a good question. That's because I told you quantum computing is able to break down data into smaller chunks. So you know the anomalies within data nodes, which uh, classical com computers can't uh, handle or analyze, Quantum, quantum computers can do that. From the uh, experiment I performed, I think user using quantum was less accurate than normal machine learning. So what is the advantage you gain? Uh, no, no, Murad. I said that you know quantum is better than using classical machine learning in the in the regression case because you know quantum computing excluded the nodes, which regression would not have been able to exclude and would have actually taken in and further given errors on. So it was better to use it. And with it, Kumar, what about transformer models in quantum computing? Uh, I would recommend message is a bit too in depth. So message will LinkedIn about this part. Uh, thank you. Yeah, sure. You're welcome. Thanks for the good presentation. What needs to be true for quantum right. Okay. So Ron Dillampe has asked a very good question. 
how can quantum computing be used widely? So the challenges are first of all costs and hardware. Like you guys all remember, like back in 1980s, a 5 MB computer would take an entire room to fit. Now 5 MB computers is less than a chip size. So yeah, probably in the next 20 years, quantum computers could also be coming in chips and all. We don't know because technology is advancing at a much accelerated pace. The only thing holding back technological advancement today is only government regulations. So it depends on how the international regulations on quantums take it further. Any algorithm that convert binary data like text images into quantum bits? Yeah, you can go on Kaiskit's website. There is actually an algorithm for this. Uh, Shil Shilandera Sharma. Okay, Christine, uh, can quantum computing be used to generate sample data sets, reduce biases, where the data is not enough? Yes, it can do that. I just did that in the notebook as well. That's exactly what I was doing too. <laughs> yeah. Any recommendation books? Well, uh, there are a few quantum computing books made by O'Reilly books. So yeah, you can look into them. Nitro okay, Nathan, nitrogen fixation and simulating quantum systems in general are natural fits for quantum computing. Uh, maybe, I, I cannot answer that because my knowledge for this would be very limited, but I'm sure you might be right. Okay. Tajani Mubarak, are there any ethical implications associated with the intersection of quantum and machine learning? Uh, well, to be honest, Tajani, even with machine learning, there's a lot of privacy and ethical violations, like you know, already existing. With quantum, because we're not using it at a wide, we're not, it's not widespread, we're not using it at a very wide scale. So right now, government regulations haven't really tackled on it yet, but they will eventually. And uh, I and you. Does hardware matter when doing quantum computing? Any advantages gained when using GPUs? Yes, uh, for images, TPUs work better than GPUs because images are tensors. So they tend tensor processing units process it better. And for quantum computing, it's mostly done with cloud computers right now. So the problem of having your own machine not being able to do them has already been resolved. I'm glad it was I'm glad the session is good. Please mention some resources. Uh, look, there are a lot of sources. First, Guys Kids uh, website on Python. And then there are already a lot of online blogs as well on how quantum computing is being applied already in data science by companies. And all of you, there's also a course that I will be publishing very soon on Udemy as well on uh, how quantum computing is going to be used with data science. It will also contain this notebook and a few other notebooks too. So yeah, you can all, it will, I will not take any money for it. It's going to be free of charge. So yeah, you all can register for it. When I launch it, I'll send it on the mentors group too. Okay. How does QC treat outliers and is it possible to overfit with uh, uh, quantum uh, QC? Okay. It basically treats outliers in multiple superposition states because it can differentiate how they could have existed within the interpolation and also how they exist within the extrapolation. So, yeah, they can treat it as both an accuracy and an error at the same time. So would quantum computers be better for classical computers? No, for smaller data sets, classical computers are enough. You're spending more money on running quantum machines to run to run a small data set would not be a wise choice. Thanks, Amal, your session. I'm glad it was. Uh, it's uploaded in the Kaggle folder. And I think Reddy will share it again with you after the session too. Uh, Rishwan, Sanchan, yes, you can use parsers and encoders to make it mitigate errors. Go, you can use that. And they're already available methods too under the Sky Skyskit library. Is Skyskit textbook in parallel quantum data repository good? Yeah, it's a good resource. And they're open queues. Uh, those of you who have your hands up, you can ask questions right now. I believe uh, I honey, have the honey. next question in line. <laughs> one at a time, one at a time, please. I believe on the next one in line. Sorry. Um, so, uh, I, my name is Leonor. I just wanted to give a background about me. Um, I'm returning to the as the technical aspect of the field of machine learning um, as machine learning engineer. Um, I was a student at Cornell. I did my undergrad there in um, CS uh, and bio was like what I studied. Um, and it just so happens through my network. I know this MIT physicist, um, he's now at MIT at Lincoln Labs, and he trained at a Nobel laureate's lab, Eric Cornell out of UC Boulder, who does a lot of quantum, uh, a lot of quantum research and um, is uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, a while ago. But I spoke with him about uh, these technologies because he was at a Silicon Valley quantum computing startup. 
And he warned me a little bit about the quantum field specifically, saying that there's a lot of underdeveloped tooling, there's a lot of hot air and hype in a lot of areas within the field because people realize VCs salivate at the term. So I wanted to know from the experiences that you've encountered with the technology, how can we and how have you preemptively prepared for the lowest hanging fruit in a substantive like development within this subfield? And how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? Okay, so compared to him, my experience is probably null. Is probably null. So yeah, I could probably not answer quest your, his, the question that well. But what I would say right now is that, look, quantum computing, uh, as I said, is now available in cloud services as well. And all of the measures like, you know, separating the wheat from shaft and even, you know, quantum controlling circuits and everything, they've to an extent already never been, have, it's been heavily automated now, especially with Python coding as well. Like if you go through the Kaiskit library, right, there are a lot of functions that have already been designed just for the exact problems that you're just right now pointing with quantum computing. But as you're, as the person you mentioned right now also said about the ethical concerns, yes, that is a major problem in quantum computing right now. Because as I said, you know, data becomes very infinite and becomes limitless, right, it, to its potential extent. So with quantum computing, you can hack into even national security databases, which otherwise cannot be hacked to or considered completely impenetrable because quantum computing power overloads against all the firewalls. So that is one major concern of quantum computing. But uh, in the rest of your questions, I wouldn't be very qualified to answer that. But I can say is that if a lot of the work by quantum computers, which was considered to be, you know, only available on expensive machines or highly trained uh, or only highly trained professionals could do, now everyone can do them because they're becoming more and more easier with automated coding. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi, Amar. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So uh, first is like, um, in terms of hardware, we know that uh, in classical computing, we use uh, these uh, core processors. So quantum technology is using anything different than in terms of processor. And second question is in um, uh, classical computing, we when we design um, models, so we use um, generally transformers. So BERT and Robert are like, these are the current uh, most efficient transformers in our modeling. So what kind of, what sort of modeling is uh, used in quantum technologies, uh, which is effective, uh, I mean, the best one in the current practices. And the third question is like, this is a practical question, like for, uh, we know uh, we need uh, very biased data for any sort of better modeling. So, um, so in terms of banking fraud data set, so if the data set is biased in the terms of 80, 20, you can say, so how com quantum computing will uh, develop better result than the classical MLDL modeling? Okay, Kabant, very good question. So, uh, so regarding your uh, regarding the best practices part, uh, Kabant. So basically, yeah. I would say first that you know, uh, in order for best practices to develop in any area, a lot of people have to be using it, right? So you can identify what's right and what's wrong. So for quantum computing, we don't have that yet because of its constant limitations right now in terms of hardware and even with cloud services. So there are no best practices right now in quantum computing. But like I demonstrated, you start with the quantum circuits, then head to the quantum generators, then look into the predictive modeling aspect. And when we talk about how quantum computing can perform better on data sets like even fraud in terms of biased data because of its superposition feature, because it can identify any data point in multiple states. Like it can even tell that if the fraud was not a fraud in this scenario and right. it might be a fraud in another scenario. That's why it can look at accuracy from multiple points. Thank you. Uh, okay, there's a few questions on the chat too. Question for Google created admins, just calculate up man. Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, I would like to add a short question again. So uh, if say the data set is not a biased data and it's almost 50 50 or 60 40 then um, in that um, case also quantum company can, quantum technology can help us yeah for, for that answer like where it can help us uh you would need an entire panel of scientists telling me that whether i know it or not so yeah i can't answer that question 
So yeah, but good question. Okay, and uh, few questions are Kushang Bansal due to randomness involved in quantum computing. Does it make it more errors? Maybe quantum computing cases are not required. Uh, okay, so Kushang, uh, what I showed was in ra or randomness in data just for the example. But otherwise, data sets which have low randomness, quantum computing, even with large randomness, can, you know, with superposition, allocate that into the right data points and in the right data frame as well. So, yeah, it can take care of that problem. And resources, there are many resources, Shagai, there are many resources available online. You can just simple Google search will give you a lot of them. Otherwise, reach out on LinkedIn, I can send you a few. Uh, do you, don't you think quantum analysis could be prone to overfitting? GG Jawal. So yes, uh, it could be prone to overfitting, but at the same time, but compared to classical models, classical computers, it can still it can still remain error free to those extents because it can look into superposition states of data. A lot of applications of healthcare, like biotech, like we even mentioned right now, in, in a sub derivative field of healthcare, but even in healthcare, in patient analysis and disease diagnosis, quantum computers are already considered being tested on. Uh, okay, and let's check in their open queue. Uh, Sunil Suraya, you are you have been raising your hand for a while. No, my uh, question is answered by someone. I mean, question is okay. raised by someone. Perfect. So, and Zainab Riaz, you also have your hand raised. Do you have a question? I did. Uh, I am actually a fellow University of London student. I was actually wondering how you managed to do so much research on your own as a one man show like it is really in, it, it is really incredible so could you please share some tips on on how you did that um it would be a huge uh, thousand word uh, 3000 word essay to say it all right now and i don't want to bore everyone with that but uh, generally, um, you have to take the initiative uh, because what I did was I Googled on my own. I made a few articles and I just and, when, and I looked at other people's work and I started to see where I could improve mine. And I reached out to a few colleagues I've just met on LinkedIn and I took advice from, let's say, 10, 15 people and then came up with the best advice on my own. But for a more better answer as a fellow student from the same. I program, have actually texted you on LinkedIn. I guess okay, I'll respond we to can that. connect later. Thank you. Sure, sure. And everyone, I've also given my uh, LinkedIn profile in the chat too. If you all want to connect, you're more than welcome to. Okay. And I think there are no more questions right now anymore. So, Rainy, uh, thank you so much for organizing this session. And, uh, and thank you for the rest of the Kaggle team as well. And uh, there's just one last question, I think, uh, in the chat. Let me just answer that. Okay, and uh, what is superposition and that is done in quantum computing Kushank Bansal? Uh, is there a hypothetical multidimensional space? So yeah, supercomputing is the hypothetical multidimensional space because it, you know, assumes scenarios in multiple uh, scenarios. It can assume um, it can assume that, hey, a company has made a profit, a company has not made a profit, a company is going to make a profit. In, it can look into all three states at once. That's what a superposition state means. Thank you, Amar. And just to answer a few questions, uh, Amar has shared the notebook and the presentation. It's in the Kagalux folder under workshops. I will also be sharing the link to the folder once the recording is ready, okay? But we appreciate your presentation today. It was very informative. It, it drew a lot of uh, questions and attention. So it's a very exciting topic. And um, you did a great job kicking us off. So thank you so much for this presentation. Um, you guys, we can also answer questions in the Discord event, Kagalex event channel. So um, Amar can take questions offline uh, around this topic there as well, okay? Because we are very close to time and I know you guys are excited to ask your questions. So please put them into the Kagalex event channel in Discord. Yes, and you're more than welcome to contact me on Discord, LinkedIn, anywhere you find, or even my email over here. Let me put that too. Yeah. So yes, and thank you so much, Rainy, for all your efforts, and including like even getting after me to also join today because I forgot to send the accept request. So yeah, thank you to the Kaggle team, Rainy, and everyone. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you, guys. Have a yeah. great day. 
they are, I 